started this morning. I want to welcome you. We've got a lot of, of guests and friends that are here. Um, clearly, you came to see me. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so uh, obviously, we've got our, our, our friend Christy McKenney is going to be here and sharing about the lighthouse. We're excited about that. Um, we have uh, three fifths of the women at the well here, um, which is even a better band name, three yeah. fifths of the women. Um, but, uh, but anyway, so uh, we're going to get started with a word of prayer. Um, and um, if this is your first time at Bedford Road, you're visiting from another church, or you're just here looking for a church, um, this is an extremely odd congregation. Um, I blame Rick. Uh, but uh, uh, our worship service, uh, our worship service is, it flows through music. We're going to have Lord's Table. This is the first time in a while that we'll actually be having Lord's Table the way that we, we generally do it, which is um, one of our elders will come and share um, and then we'll invite everybody to, to come forward and receive the elements, and he'll give instructions for that. And uh, those, if you're not comfortable coming forward um, and receiving the elements, um, there are some prepackaged ones you can grab when we stand to sing. Um, they're on the table in the back, and you can just grab that. Um, but uh, anyway, let's have a word of prayer, and we're going to get right into everything. Our internet connection has already failed, so the video stream is not working. So after I'm done with this, I get to go type stuff. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> Now let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Yes, I'm proud of my typing skills. <laughs> You're proud of yours too? That's good. Okay. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for bringing us together. Lord, we thank you for um, more than anything else, uh, your presence with us. And we come together today uh, in this place which has been sanctified um, specifically for the worship of your church knowing that um, this is not where you are confined to. Uh, human hands cannot build a place that can hold you. Uh, and Lord, so we ask as we, as we lift up our voices, as we lift up our hearts, as we hear with our ears, as we do with our hands, uh, Lord, that all this would be for your glory and praise. We ask all of this in Jesus' name, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have got the greatest reason in all of the world and in all of eternity to sing out loud and to shout our praises to God. And he has given us eternal life through his son, Jesus Christ, and that's what we'll be singing about today. It says in the scripture, which is um, a common scripture that many may know, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have everlasting life. God loved the world. He's not some angry judge as sometimes the world, you know, makes him out to be sitting up there on his majestic throne with lightning bolts ready to zap those who mess up. Uh, that's what people think, but it's just simply not true. God, um, he didn't send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And I just, I read that, and I'm like, wow, he, he loves us. Um, John said in the Bible, he said, to all who receive him, to all who receive Jesus Christ and believe in his name, he gives the right to become children of God. That's huge. The, to be a child of the creator of the universe who loved us so much that he came down as man and, and he gave his life for us so that we may have life. And that's something to sing about. <laughs> So we're going to sing. We're going to lift up our voices. We're going to shout it out. Um, over here we have Melissa, who she has, um, I met her through um, piano lessons. She inquired about her son, and then she ended up taking the lessons herself. <laughs> um, she uh, has been coming to our church here and there since the summer. And then this here is Stephanie. Uh, I got to tell you a little story about that, <laughs> how we met. Uh, Leo, his wife, Debbie, as many of you know, um, Debbie's sister... Barb heard Stephanie singing at a conference, um, and Deb, uh, Barb was working the conference. Um, she was, you know, it was serving, serving yeah. yeah, the food, she was catering. And um, she heard Stephanie sing, and at the end, she went up to Stephanie, and she told Stephanie that, you need to meet Nicole. <laughs> so Stephanie said, I would love to. And so Debbie texts me, and she said, Nicole, Barb told me about this woman that, you, <laughs> that she met, and so we found her on Facebook. She stalked her. <laughs> we found her on Facebook. Here's her video. You need to definitely meet this young woman. 
So I'm like, I'm not going to meet someone that I don't know on the internet. Like, who does that? <laughs> like, so I did. <laughs> it was at a time, the video that they sent me was Stephanie wrote, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Stephanie wrote a melody to Psalm 91. And in that time frame, I was reading and going over Psalm 91 that week. And um, I was dealing with some health issues and, you know, just dealing with stuff. And that psalm was an anchor in my life. And then right when I heard Stephanie singing on the, on the Facebook video, I'm like, Wah! just crying, you know, because I'm like, this is a God thing right here. It's a God moment. And so I reached out to her. And I thanked Debbie for stalking her. And <laughs> so that's how we met. And um, we've, uh, January uh, 8th of last year was when we met in person. And what was supposed to be like an hour meeting ended up being like three and a half. And we just really kind of, um, yeah, we, yeah. Now here we are. <laughs> we are writing music together and, and worshiping together with um, three other women, um, Melissa and Ari and Michelle, and um, it was neat how God brought us all together. Again, it's a God thing, so, so we're going to sing. I'm going to stop talking. Um, if you don't know the songs, that's okay, because you'll become familiar. We do have plenty of repeats in these songs, um, so I invite you to sing together and sing with us, rejoicing and praising God for His Son. We are the children of God, and we are His children of love.
Amen. to read this portion of scripture this morning from Psalm 34, and then I'm just going to pray through that scripture as the Holy Spirit leads. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. 
My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Oh, holy God, we bless your name. You are so worthy of all praise. We can never even comprehend how deep and wide and long and high your love for us is. God, thank you for how you're shaping us, that we're learning day by day more of who you are, that that increases our worship. God, we thank you for what you're doing in this church these voices raised together, magnifying your name. God, we just ask for more, just more every day to teach us for your praise to be in our mouth no matter what. God, when trials come, let that praise be even louder. As we are in the fire, you are with us and you have a purpose for that. Help us to trust you, to just keep our eyes fixed. And God, in that, people will see your glory in our lives, that we are not shaken by the things of this world. We are not shaken by our trials and circumstances that to everybody else look bad, God, but we know even in those you are good because that's who you are. So help us to just continue to lift that out and magnify your name with every breath in every moment. We just long for that and we long for you more and more and more of you. God, we love you so much. Christ be magnified, let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. Amen. You may be seated. Oh, good morning, everyone. It's good to see everybody uh, here this morning. Uh, yeah, tomorrow we get to uh, celebrate Valentine's Day. And for a lot of us anyway, uh, we'll be uh, celebrating the love that we have between uh, each other, my wife and I, 40, 46 years and it's hard to even imagine what my, what my life would be like were it not for my wife. Uh, I don't even want to think about it. I go back to, you know, 46 years ago where I was at and to think where my life may have headed if it were not for my wife. So I owe her my life, really, because of where we're at and I'm grateful. And so uh, what do we do? We celebrate, we rejoice, you know, and we're glad. This morning, I have a harder assignment for you. Not just about thinking about your marriage life, but thinking about your Christian life. Do you ever stop and think how hard it might be to think about what it would be like with, in your life without Christ? Huh. Uh, it's an awful thing to think about. It really is. But I want you to think about it for just a second, and then we'll go on to the rejoicing part later. Because with, without him, what would we have? The apostle Peter, he was enthralled with that idea. Except he didn't write about it in the negative, what he was lacking. He wrote about it all in the positive, about what he achieved because of Christ. But I know that if I turned it into the negative for a while and realized what would be missing, here's a short list, according to Peter. We would be missing out on the born-again experience. 
We would have no hope because there would be no resurrection. We would have no inheritance in heaven without Christ. We would have no salvation even available to us. See, it gets kind of discouraging. That's why Peter wrote it in the positive. Just, just three verses in 1 Peter chapter 1, he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept for you in heaven, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And a couple of verses later, he went on to say, and I think it relates to our situation today, where we get to celebrate, we get to rejoice in the love that the Father has for us through his son, Jesus. He said this, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexplicable, inexpressible, and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Today we get to celebrate. That's how important it is to come around the table, to partake of the elements that remind us of that new covenant that we have that God established through his one and only son, Jesus. This morning we're going to come, as the pastor said a little earlier, uh, back to the older way. We're going to come up and, and receive the elements in the front. There'll be uh, four gentlemen up here to help you uh, receive the elements. Use the outside aisles to come down, and then you can return going up the middle aisle and then just return to your seats. Hold on to the elements, and we'll instruct you to eat and drink together. Let's pray. So Father, we do come and we rejoice in our salvation. We rejoice in our born again experience. We rejoice in the shed blood of Jesus and the resurrection from the dead. We rejoice in the inheritance that's kept for us in heaven, secure by your word. We get, we're so grateful, God. We come to celebrate this new covenant in the body and blood of, of Jesus. And uh, may it be, renew us today uh, with that uh, eternal and everlasting precious love that uh, you have for us. It's in Jesus' name that we come and we pray. Amen.
And so we participate in his love. Let's take the bread reminding us of his body broken for our salvation. The cup is a, a very precious sign of the blood of Jesus. The blood that was shed for us without which there was no forgiveness of sins. We have all that as a benefit as we come before him and drink this cup together in Jesus' name.
sometimes all we have to do is just breathe his name, and that's enough for a prayer. Thank you. You may be seated. So we're going to invite Chris McKinney uh, to come. Nicole shared about the rather curious path by which uh, she met Stephanie. I randomly one day texted a pastor friend of mine and said, do you still have a pastor's group meeting at your church? He said, yeah, 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 come on over. It's in my office one Thursday. And I come in and I, I met um, Stephanie's friend, Mike, who had been pastor of the Great Exchange. And then I met Bob McKenney at the same meeting and then said, I came home. I said, Nicole, I'd like the, a couple of the guys know the Stephanie person that you've been talking to. Then through, then through Bob, through Stephanie, Nicole heard about Christy. I heard about her through Bob, her husband. And she get, it's a long story. Anyway, it's a messy God thing. It's a timey-wimey, wibbly-wobbly thing. And, um, and so we're, we're pleased to invite Christy to come up and share about uh, the lighthouse. And then after, after she's done sharing, um, we're going to take a few minutes for questions and answers if anybody has those. And so Christy, come on up. fall down the stairs. Okay. If I go too close over here, I might topple down. That would be bad. <laughs> Can everybody hear me okay? Good morning. It's so lovely to be here with you all today. You know, it's, it's hard. We miss when we can't be at our own churches, and, but it's also like amazing to just come and see extended church family and just feel the love. So I'm just so happy to be here. Thank you so much. Um, so this morning, I'm here to tell you about the lighthouse. Um, but I cannot tell you about the lighthouse without telling you a bigger story. And, and it's not my story. It's, it's God's story. This whole thing is God's story. And I have a part in that story. Um, and many people actually have a part in this particular story, but I'm going to start there. I first want to just tell you a statistic, and I know we have some, some kids in here, so trust me, parents, I'm going to keep this pretty reasonable. So, um, But some statistics I want to share with you is that one in six boys and one in four girls will be sexually abused before they turn 18. And what's more uh, shocking, if that's not something you've heard before, is that only one out of every 10 children who have been sexually abused ever come forward. One out of 10. And so what happens to those nine for every child that, that is coming forward and getting the help and getting the support? What's happening to those nine that aren't? And I'll tell you, they're living in, in silence. They're living in fear. They're living with shame. Seeds have been planted telling them that they are not good people. And they're carrying that into their life. And it's ending up showing up in very different ways, destructive ways oftentimes. So I will tell you that I am one of those statistics. I'm not only one of the four, but I'm also one in the ten. And so when I was five years old and I was sexually abused by my stepfather, I just knew at that moment, and it actually was one of my very first memories, was I am a very bad person and no one can ever find out about it. So that was my first memory as a five-year-old girl. So life goes on, right? And I move on and... Um, and, you know, I move, I go on with my life. I'm still living in the family with my stepfather. We're a middle class, upper middle class family in Connecticut. Nobody knows of anything going on. And, um, and I get into high school, and I'm a track runner. And, and so, sure enough, I am a perfect victim for somebody because I have this broken antenna where I am not sensing danger, danger. I am not sensing any of that. And so my coach takes me under his wing and for four years grooms me and then ultimately sexually assaults me. So again, I am back to 
I'm ashamed. No one can ever, ever know. And so I, I go off to college and I decide no more track, not doing that anymore. And this, the path of destruction just starts rolling in my life. And on the outside, you know, I'm, I'm looking okay. I'm looking all right. But on the inside, I am a mess. And, um, and so I continue on. I end up getting some counseling. I start talking to people about what has happened in my life. And things are looking up. And it's, it's really, it, it was looking wonderful. And I start getting into, I, I become a psychology major in college. I start um, deciding, I'm going to help these kids. This is what God put me on this earth to do, is help children who have been abused. And I didn't really know God. So this was God who was this big in my life. But I, I was, you know, it was easy for me to be like, God put me on this earth to do this work so that I can give back. And, um, and so I, you know, start becoming pretty successful. I open up child advocacy centers all over New Hampshire. I have, you know, I'm getting all these awards. I'm getting all these accolades. And man, was I feeling good, right? I'm doing God's work and I'm, and I'm getting all this recognition for it. Well, you know what? It was just not exactly what I needed at all. And it was I, looking for those awards, looking for all that attention was just my way of just hiding and running away from the darkness that I felt. So through that was lots of drinking, was lots of, of just not helpful behavior in my life. Bad relationships over and over again, just not, not good. And then I met Jesus. I met Jesus. Like, he just showed up in my life. And all of a sudden, I was like, wait, I need healing in Jesus. And, and let me tell you, I'm a late bloomer. This was only 10 years ago. And... Uh, and so I started to really change. My life just started to change. And I started to really see who I needed and who my identity was in. And, um, and it was amazing. And I had quit drinking. I've been sober now for almost eight years. And it was, it was like God just started building up in my life. And it was, it was amazing. So through that, um, I started, the Holy Spirit was just like, man, you got to tell people about this. Like, I'm still in my career of helping kids, but I'm like, I got to talk to women who like don't know Jesus, who have maybe had this happen to them or had other traumas. Like, Jesus is who can heal you. And so I just, on the side, you know, from my regular secular career, I was just starting this ministry called Light of Life. And I was just going to write some blogs. And, and again, God was just pouring through me of just remembering things in my past. And oh, by the way, he was there for all of it. He was there for all of it. And, and that might be hard to, for people to hear, like, how can God let that happen? But amen. I look back and I'm like, oh, thank you, God, that you were there. Because now you are here with me too, and you are helping me to reach other people. But that's a whole other story. So, so, um, so yeah, so God shows up in my life, and uh, I quit drinking, and God's like, hey, you need to tell other people. So we start Light of Life Ministries. But then that just didn't feel like it was enough. And over and over again, I kept thinking, how can I share this? So we developed a Bible study and through all of the blogs, and we called it Out of Darkness. And this Bible study was to, I was going to bring it to churches and offer it for free for people who wanted to heal in Jesus, for women in particular who, who had been abused and just wanted that healing. And so it's an eight-week process of um, going through, you know, shame and uh, trust issues and body image issues. And, and how, does, how does the Bible, what does the Bible say about that? What does God say about that? And um, so through that process came this lighthouse where God, in his typical way, not like Morgan Freeman, Christy, you need to open the lighthouse, but kind of like that. It was like I was driving 
And I called my husband and was like, I, I think I have to open a, a place, a transitional housing program, and it's called The Lighthouse. Like, and luckily, my, my husband did not say, okay, you're crazy, honey. And, but he was like, yeah, duh. And, uh, and so, so, again, with God's pushing me, pushing every way, because I kept saying, no, 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 this is insane. I have this big job. I ha everything's good. I'm, I'm a Christian. I don't drink. Like, what? I'm good. Like, we're good. And, uh, but no, God just kept pushing. And so I developed this program. It's called The Lighthouse. And um, I even feel weird saying I developed it because really it was God. And it's a nine to 12 month program where women who are in crisis can come to heal. And the women that I'm saying are in crisis are in crisis because of substance use disorder, because of sex trafficking, because of domestic violence, because of mental illness, um, because of homelessness. And almost all of them, actually, who am I kidding? All of them also have a history of being sexually abused or at least traumatized in some way. And so this house is for them to come and heal in Jesus. And so this nine to 12 month program, they come in, they live, they live like a family in a home that is loving and filled with Jesus loving things. <laughs> and, and, um, and so we have classes every day. Um, we have classes in the morning. We have classes in the afternoon that are all Christian based and they are all around helping to heal um, through, again, substance use, through other addictions. Um, and then we also connect them in the community. So we're kind of a weird organization in that we are a Christian organization, but we're also a community organization because it feels like that's really important, right? We don't want to just hide them in a box and say, okay, you're going to get healed, but then we're going to kick you out and go fend for yourself in the world. No, we want to connect them in the community as well because eventually they're going to be the lights in the community. So we go, and so the women are connected with counselors, with medical professionals, um, substance use disorder counselors, um, and wellness, so, you know, we do wellness activities, and so it's this all-around work to help them to heal holistically in all of that, again, with Jesus at the center. And then my most favorite part is that we have partner churches, <clears throat> and so our partner churches are there for the women to go to. So the women get to go and visit a church and, and maybe go a few times and find a church that feels really good to them. It feels like their church family. You know how that feels, right? When you're like, oh yeah, this is my church. Like you know it the minute you're at a church. Um, and so the, the reason we do that is because we want them to, to find that authentic, loving church family relationship because when they leave, that church family is who is continuing to care for them and love them. Um, and so that has been an amazing part, and I'm, I'm most excited about that part because this is a project that is all Christ-centered. And anything that I've tried to do in this project where I tried to take control, it never worked. <laughs> And it didn't. It never worked, which is why this whole thing is God. Many, many times I have had to bow down and just be like, yep, I need to be more obedient to what God is, is leading me on this, um, in this house. And so right now, I'm happy to say we, we uh, when this whole thing started, and again, I could talk for like five hours, and I'm not going to. Pastor's like, please don't. Um, <laughs> But when this whole thing happened where God, you know, put, came and said, you got to do this, um, we had no money. This is a nonprofit that had no money associated with it. And, um, and so long story short, we ended up getting $458,000 from the city of Manchester to purchase and renovate a Christian house. If that's not God, I don't know what is. Like, because th th there's no way that would have happened. And it was right, the, as soon as we started talking to the aldermen, the pandemic happened. So um, it, it was all God. And then since then, we have just had churches come around us, individuals come around us, Christians that are supporting us financially. So we were able to open in December. And we have six ladies in our house right now and I have just got to tell you, 
It is amazing. You're the first church I'm talking to since we actually have women in the house. And I cannot even describe every day when I'm in there, it is like, wow, God is in this house and he is doing amazing things in each and every one of these women. Um, a few things that really have come up for me um, that were surprising is the, the age range. So we have women in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60. So we have this range that we had no idea that that would be the range. Um, I also had no idea how fast these women would bond with each other. Like, they are a family. Like, I you know, talk about them, beef, but they are a family. They sit together every night. They have dinner together. They eat meals together. They pray together, and they argue. And, <laughs> and you know what? After they argue, they pray for the person they're just arguing with. Like, it's amazing what God is doing. And, um, and so I just see, like, that amazing light that is just sparking and growing and... Um, so eventually, you know, after the nine to 10 months, nine to 12 months, they will move on. We have a, a revive center where we will continue to, to connect with these women and keep supporting them as they're out in the world, as they are out in their jobs, in their um, apartments, where, wherever they are. And so, um, you know, we tell them all the time, you will forever be our family, whether you're in this house or not, we are family forever. Um, and so it's just... Magnificent. I will tell you one last thing about these women is, and, and God, um, I have two case managers right now, and the three of us all agree, like, how is it that these women have come in and, like, immediately we love them so much? Like, we love them, and that's God. God, like, we, like, th these are complete strangers to us, um, but the love is, is unbelievable, and... Uh, so here is what, uh, you know, I'm here because I want to tell you about this program that is amazing and that is doing amazing work, and it's all God. Um, but the story, you know, of this in my life with God and then coming here now and doing this full-time ministry, um, but the story's not over yet because these women and God is just, it's eternity, and there, he's just going to continue to work. And we are all going to be in eternity together. And that is just amazing to me. Um, so what I'm asking of you is please pray. Uh, that is our number one thing. This all happens and happened because of prayer. Um, and, you know, the enemy attacks all the time. And we're used to it at this point. But, man, the prayers are what help us through those. And so please pray. Pray over the house. Pray over the women. Um, and pray that we would continue to, to receive support and funding as well. Um, please also consider supporting us. And you can check us out. You, can, you know, again, I thought we were going to get funding from the state or something. And God's like, nope. Uh, this is something that is going to be funded by Christians. And it really is. It's like 80% is coming from Christians that are just individually supporting us, um, as well as churches. And so, you know, I ask for you to consider being a church that supports us also. Um, but again, the just staying connected and maybe volunteering with us. We have lots of volunteer opportunities. Um, and so I ask that you write your name and your email on the um, form if you haven't already. And we can reach out to you. You will be on our, our uh, newsletter. And so you can see the different ways that you can volunteer, either directly working with women or doing, you know, other volunteer things like, you know, the big clean out of the basement. <laughs> which is going to happen in the spring. Um, so I'm happy to take questions now. Okay, so let the kids head down. We'll probably be another 20 minutes or so, 20, 25 minutes. So we'll let the kids head down real quick. I should have dismissed them before you started talking, but that's what happens when I have 87 million things floating around in my head. Um, 
All right, so what we want to do is uh, we're going we're gonna to ask Christy some questions. And normally when we do the Q&A, we kind of sit in here, and it's very casual and relaxed and everything. There's a lot of stuff up here. Um, but I, I want to, I wanna, the primary thing, I guess my first question for you, Christy, just real quick, just in terms of solid numbers, um, how much does it cost to run the lighthouse on a, on a month, and how much do you get, do you have? <laughs> That's a great question. So God has been very good. We just uh, completed our, our new budget for the upcoming year. And it costs about $16,000 per month to run the house. Um, the good news is we don't pay a lot into the house because we we bought it. Like, it's, it, it is ours. Um, and so... Uh, you know, a lot of the f the money that we use is for staff and to and to for client specific related things, um, and so yes, so yeah. And so I'm going to ask a pointed question because you brought up staff. So how many staff do you need, and how many staff do you have? Thank you. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we. Currently, have, um, we have myself, and we have two case managers that work during the day. Um, and then we have some overnight resident assistants. And these are positions where from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., and they can sleep. They're just in the house, a support person, a Christian, you know, who is there and available in case there's an emergency. What we really need is a couple more of those overnight resident assistants so that when somebody is sick, we have somebody else to be there. And we also need some uh, weekend case management. So it's like, you know, a per diem kind of thing. Think of like a nurse, like you sign up for two Saturdays a month and you work 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. on that Saturday and you get a stipend. Um, and that stipend is $180. So if anybody knows of anybody, or please just pray um, because we really need, need that staff. So... Other questions we have? Only female, yes. Yep. Other questions? I will just one. I will say something else about that, though. You know, I think it's really important. Um, so my husband, who's a pastor, he comes in the house periodically. The women know him too because they come to our church sometimes, and um, and they come to our Bible studies or whatnot. And I think it's really important for women to see healthy relationships. And so if we had situations where a couple wanted to come in to do some kind of event or activity, like that would be great because I think that's important is to have, to see positive men and male-female interactions. God. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but it is God. But they, uh, yes, they're referred um, through agencies, different agencies, um, Families in Transition, through 1269 Cafe, through the Cypress Center. Um, so word has spread because, honestly, I get calls every day, multiple calls every day for people that want to come in, and we have to turn them away, which is very difficult to do. Yeah. Um, but we do. And I, I think it's, it's important that we... We've we've done this a little bit with the homeless the homeless connections with with Mike going out and seeing what is there what it, we don't see the invisible needs um, this is a, a tremendous need uh, especially especially in Manchester now uh, now these issues exist in Merrimack and areas like that you need to understand Manchester we don't like to talk about the reality of sex trafficking and drugs and and all of those things it is a very very very, very uh, big thing. Uh, it is happening on all levels all through our culture. And we think, well, we're in New Hampshire. We're not dealing with that. Um, I can refer you to several people that will point to that. And the other side of it is, in terms of the network of the church, it could be much, much more robust to be able to support ministries like the Lighthouse. Um, it's crazy to think that in a city of I know there's only 165,000 people or whatever there is in, Mar in Manchester. There are two of these kind of ministries, right? That's it. Two. Um, that, that, that's mind-blowing to me, um, how, how, how much support is, how much work is needed and how much we're able to do. Um, other questions? What's the capacity of your uh, program? 
Great question. Uh, we can have up to 10 women, and we can have their children. Um, so if women have children, they can also come. Uh, right now, we don't have any children in, in the house, but yeah, up to 10. Other questions? Yeah, well, right now, so, so right now we have six women, and remember, we just opened in December, and so we have, in, in increments of a couple weeks at a time, we've brought in the, these women, and we are at a place where we need to pause and let them acclimate, get there, get, just, it's, it, we need to pause <laughs> and have things kind of settle, and, and the staff settle, too, because we're brand new, so we're at this place where we're saying, like, oops, we don't have a policy for that, or oh, we didn't think of that, and so we're like, kind of, you know, continuing to strengthen the foundation. Um, in a couple of months, we will have another group that will come in and and do that again. So that's one of the reasons. The other reason is sometimes, um, well, if I tell I tell them what that we're a Christian organization, even though all are welcome, some people actually don't want that. Um, also. If they are um, in a place where maybe it's their primary situation is a mental health situation, but they're not really, um, you know, have any trauma or we are not equipped to handle that kind of like acute or uh, on, ongoing mental health. And sadly, there's so much of, of that, of just people with mental illness that need housing. I mean, yeah. we could talk about that on a whole other yeah. day too. Yeah, there's, there's, this is... We could really open a can of worms. We could, we could literally spend, and we may at some point, just planting the seed, we may, we could literally spend an entire weekend dealing with all of these kind of levels of ministries that, that for the most part, and I'm not saying there aren't churches and Christians out there doing it, but for the most part, this is very invisible to the church, in New England particularly, um, uh, and, and so it's, it's one of those things um, that's sitting out there. There's, there's all kinds of issues. And, and I'm just going to add on to this. Put too many people into this program at once, you're not going to be able to support them properly. So you might be able to push them through the system, but they've been pushed through, their, through the system their entire lives. And what we want to do is build uh, a network, just like we did with our church, our congregation, where we went, okay, this is not about how many people can we jam into the space. It's about how can we be healthy, how can we grow, how can we, how, how can we let the Holy Spirit work. If we don't give the Holy Spirit space, uh, we can't expect him to, to work in people's hearts. So, um, so that's a very important facet, and I appreciate going, going slow. You guys know me. I'm, I'm a go slower kind of person when it comes to this kind of stuff. Other questions? So thank you, great question. So it's, the program is nine to 12 months. Um, I technically, it's technically nine months, but we add on the 12 months also just in case there's some hiccups or whatever. Um, and also that, that last three months is, is really about supporting them out in the community as, they're, as they do start new jobs, new education, whatever they're doing. Um, we do collect rent. So right now, a lot of the women we're getting through Section 8 housing, so we, we get rent from them. If they don't qualify or whatever, then we have a percentage of their income that goes. But it's a very small amount. And the reason we do that is, this, is that, is they to have some skin in the game. Um, and also, you can't be teaching about financial, uh, you know, betterment if you're just not paying anything. Um, so I will say, um, also, one of the things that I did not mention is that we have a program called Crown Financial. Many of you might have heard of that. It's a Christian-based financial mentoring program. And so at phase three, which is that last part of their stay with us, they actually go through that program with a mentor that's a Christian woman um, that really helps them with budgeting, with figuring out like all of that, down payment, down. We want to set them up for success. Um, and so the other thing is that... Um, 
in the house, just not monetarily. They, you know, everybody has chores, everybody has responsibilities. It's a very structured environment in that way. Um, although I'll say it's very structured, but it's also, God is so good. The women just take it up. They just do it. Like, it's not like, do your chores. It's like everybody wants to pitch in. They all want to be there. This is a program that is not mandatory. So they want to be there. They want it to work. They want to help in the house. They want to, you know, somebody gets hurt. People are helping the others, that person do their chores. Like, it's amazing to watch um, all that is happening. So I hope that answered your question. It was very long because that's what I do. So we have three phases, or four phases, including the one out in the community. So the three phases is one, stabilization. So that's the first three months. That's getting stable. If they are addicted, that is detoxing and, and just getting. Um, we are able to, we provide medication, which um, the only other program that's similar to us does not allow people to be on any medication. So we are actually the only one of our kind in the city. But... So stabilization is, you know, getting a wellness check, getting checked out mentally, mental health wise, you know, getting medication set, making sh like just, you know, what it sounds like. Um, and so that's the first phase. And then the second phase is to really dig deep more into the healing, um, being more involved with the AA meetings, which we do have them go out to if, if, if they need that, um, being more involved with their counselor, um, setting up goals with us and kind of making headway in that way. At that point, too, we have um, some outside sources where we do, we will be doing some um, volunteer work, like through the animal shelter. And so they can be going out more and more with that kind of thing. Um, and then three, the third phase, that's when they can actually start, like if they want to, let's say, for example, the New Hampshire Food Bank is amazing, and they have this program where you can, and we get food from them, and you can, um, for eight weeks, be trained to be in the culinary arts, and it's free. And so if one of our women was interested in that, then in the third phase, they would be able to go every day. We would drive them to that to be trained um, so the same is for school, if at that point they want to be going back to school or online or other job training things, that's in that third phase when they're getting ready to launch, as we say. So Christy's going to be available after service to answer some other questions. Um, I think it, it's, it's tremendous uh, to be able to, to participate in this. So thank you so much. Thank you for coming. So hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Hold up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reboot just for a second, just because of time. We're going to let the, la the women of the well are going to finish us out. I'm going to give you the shortest sermon you've ever heard from me. Are you ready? <laughs> all right, so all the announcements are in the bulletin. But I, 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 part, of me, part of me felt like, okay, well, I've just moved the, the message to next week. However, everything from what Ray shared at the, at the, the Lord's table um, to the music that was sung... Uh, to what Christy just shared, fit in with the passage of Scripture we're supposed to cover today. So I just want to give it to you. I want to give you a couple of thoughts, and then I'm going to invite the ladies to come up and finish us up. Um, and, and you can just sing us out, sing us out. I know, I know, disorganized religion, right? Um, I just want to share with you from the book of Colossians real quick. Last week we talked about Jesus being the transcendent sustainer of all things and, and talked about how he... He is both the firstborn of creation and the firstborn of the resurrection from the dead. But I, I want to just grab our response to that real quick in Colossians chapter 1. And I want to start with verse 21 because this is where Christy was talking about when Jesus met me. This is the moment. This is the shift. You who once were alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds. You who were once... Um, alienated and literally mind enemies, that your thoughts were in opposition to God. You who were once alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds, the Greek word is porneia, um, wickedness, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. This is talking about Jesus. 
in order to present you. And we need to claim this moment in Scripture. We need to claim, first of all, I was an enemy of God. We, we don't like to talk about ourselves that way. We like to think we're not too bad. I was okay before Jesus showed up. I was not okay before Jesus showed up. I was an alien. My mind was turned against him. But then he reconciled us in his body of flesh by his death. Um, and, and by the way, in, in Greek, um, the word alienated and the word reconciled, they, they rhyme. Okay, they, have a, they have a rhythmic nature. I'm not going to bore you with all of that. That's the con- contrast. But he says, in order to present you how? Holy, blameless, and above reproach, where? Before him. See, we talk about the gospel being about Jesus. And even my transformation is about him. Because he loves you so much. He wants to give you to himself. Not in the state that we are in when he finds us but transformed by his grace. And when we don't get an idea of that, we drag around with us all the darkness that we hide and we pretend that doesn't exist, right? And, and Christy talked about her background, and we could all talk about our background, but there, there, we, we drag it around and we think about the past all the time. Oh, this turned me into a person. This, this did this to me. I'm no good. This happens to me because of my past. And then we, we try to make it go away. It doesn't go away. It doesn't disappear when you become a believer. Your pain, your past does not disappear. What happens is that God takes that, Jesus takes it, and he makes you holy and he's blameless and above reproach. Now, how does he do that? He reconciles you to himself through himself. Jesus takes all of our darkness, all of our shadows, all of our brokenness, all of our suffering, all of our past, he takes it on himself. It's okay, he can handle it. And he presents us to himself. You know that when God looks at us, he does not see that. He sees Jesus. In order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach for Him, before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, Stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now, I just want to grab this moment here. There's so many people that read that, if indeed you continue, and they think, I will be presented to Christ, holy, blameless, and above reproach, if I do a good job. That is not what Paul is saying. Because I want you to read this the right way. If you continue in the faith, does it say if you continue in your faith? No. It says if you continue in the faith, Jesus is the faithful one. The faith is continuing in him. Not being perfect, not not fixing all the problems of myself so that I'm, I'm good enough but rather simply finding my identity in him. You will become stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope. You know what you you need to be as a Christian? You need to be settled in the reality of who you are in Jesus. Because if you are not, you're going to be up and down constantly. You're going to constantly feel that you're not adequate because if every time you fail, it's your fault. Every time you succeed, it's your credit. And the reality is, it's all about Jesus. Listen, I am so glad I don't have to preach for 45 minutes this morning. Because I ain't feeling it. I wasn't feeling it yesterday. (laughs) I wasn't feeling it the day before. Certainly not feeling it this morning. But Jesus went ahead and preached a sermon anyway, and I'm going to let him finish it up with the ladies.
You are not hidden There's never been a moment You were forgotten You are not hopeless Though you have been broken Your innocence stolen I hear you whisper underneath your breath I hear your SOS, your SOS. I will send out an army to find you in the middle of the darkest distance that cannot be covered over and over you're not defenseless I'll be your shelter Psalm 150, it says, praise the Lord. So let us praise him in this sanctuary. Those in his mighty heavens also praise the Lord. And let us praise him according to his excellent greatness. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Will you stand together as we sing our last song, Great Are You, Lord.
I'll uh, lift up voices of praise for what God has done today. Um, we thank all those who are used as his instruments this, this morning. Uh, Christy will be in the back of the sanctuary or be floating around somewhere. You'll be able to find her uh, if you have any questions for her. My brothers and sisters, go in peace.